So it's July 22nd at 10 past 10 in the morning, and I'm sitting with Dave Peters. Okay, so just to start, could you describe the position or positions that you had um, while you were working at the bunker? Okay, first of all, uh, I was not working full time at the bunker. Um, my job uh, in Emergency Preparedness Canada, as it was called then, was Director of Emergency Operations Coordination. And so I did various things from uh, running the day-to-day -day operations center downtown to financial assistance pre and post disasters to uh, running various committees dealing with emergency preparedness, uh, vital points and other such committees. About 20, 25% of my uh, time was probably spent trying to ensure that this facility, the Central Emergency Government Headquarters at Canadian Forces Station CARP, was uh, ready in case of a nuclear war. And so I had staff that were devoted to solely that, and I had staff that were partially devoted to doing that. So uh, during my time, which was from about as Director of Emergency Operations Coordination, which was from about 1983 to 89, 90. Uh, we ran a lot of exercises out here. We, we tried to make sure the place was as ready as possible. After the end of the Cold War and when I became Director General of Operations, um, for the first um, little while, uh, we basically maintained this on a mothball basis until 92, uh, when the military kicked us out of this place and the whole of the civil defense and continuity of government programs began to uh, be dismantled. So my time here, I guess, would be from sort of 83 to 92. Again, only part time here. I had people who would come out here regularly once every week or so, and some doing projects to upgrade the facilities. Uh, some just to make sure that the military didn't encroach on the space. Um, and uh, <clears throat> we had had a problem with that, which I'll describe later. Anyway, uh, at the end of the Cold War, we ceased having exercises and then just basically uh, uh, kept the thing going. This was one of, of course, of almost 50 facilities across the country. There was this facility, the Central Emergency Government Headquarters, and then in the regions, in the provinces, there were six regional emergency government headquarters. And uh, there were literally tens, 20, 30, 40 uh, zone emergency government headquarters located in various of the provinces. And uh, the details of that are in the archives here and, and whatnot. So I'm not sure how far you want to go in that. But in terms of this place, um, Actually, my first contact with this place was in the mid-70s. I had come back from Pakistan and been posted to, and it was in the military at the time, I was a, a major, I was posted to the uh, Uplands Construction Engineering, uh, the Base Construction Engineer's office, office and um, one of those, one of the responsibilities of that office was the maintenance of this facility. So I came out here probably in 1975 uh, with the engineering officer at the time, Captain Dennis Dart, and he took me through this facility. And uh, we basically did the quasi VIP tour. Um, and uh, we saw the movie, The Nuclear Roof in the cabinet room. And then after we went to this facility, we were only here for a couple hours. And we did a pretty detailed tour including of the Federal Warning Center, which I can talk about later as well. Uh, in fact, you might even take notes about what I say I'm going to talk about later because I might forget to talk about it later. Anyway, we then left this facility, which was the uh, basically the, uh, um, the transmit, uh, receiver building and went to Perth. And just outside of Perth is a smaller was a smaller version of this, about an eighth the size, two stories, and a smaller floor plan than this. And I believe that was the transmitter facility associated with this. So there's, there was the two facilities. The one in Perth, uh, after this facility was closed down in 94, I think it was, uh, was rapidly sealed and is probably now just full of water. Um, 
So that's the first time I came here. And in fact, at the time, I went to visit the uh, nuclear, the radiation fallout filter room. And we had discovered that it was a special built filter, basically wood and layers of, of uh, activated carbon and other material. And so I'd ask that they do a test of that um, uh, facility, that, that filter, because it apparently had been in line ever since the building was commissioned in 1961 or so. So a filter that's in line for, at that time, it would have been 14 or so years, 15 years, 14 years, um, can deteriorate. They did tests on it, and as I understand it, it was pretty well, it was still 60% effective. I guess, I think that information is available either in our archives or probably in D&D's archives if you can get to it. Um, but the, uh, we did initiate on the basis of that a, a project to replace those filters and uh, I guess over the, those filters and we looked at the other filters in the other emergency government facilities, the regional facilities, and uh, determined that maybe they should be replaced as part of one project. So. A, uh, a document was initiated to begin that. And of course, then I, after a few years, as it is the case of the custom in the military, I was posted uh, away. I went to uh, uh, staff college for a few years. And when I came back, uh, uh, basically, um, I went, well, well, I was into staff college. And then in the early 80s, I got out of the military and joined Emergency Preparedness Canada, Emergency uh, uh, Planning Canada, as it was called then. And uh, my new boss, Don Hall, the Director of General Operations, basically said, well, as part of your DEOC responsibilities, you're in charge of the bunkers. Oh, I said, that's really interesting. Uh, so I, he said, and your first job is to come out here and take the press through. Uh, there was a group of press people who wanted to see the place. A uh, little background on that. In uh, uh, the uh, Trudeau era, um, one of the, t uh, one of the uh, announcements he made, he knew about this. It was a secret facility until he made his announcement. Uh, one of his announcements was the uh, acknowledgement or the public announcement of the existence of this place. And it had been uh, considered an E site, E-A-S-E, -E, standing for... Um, Let's see, uh, uh, emergency, no, I'm not sure exactly what the E stood for. The last part of it is signals establishment. Um, anyway, it was, had, had been a, put together as, a, as a, um, a cover for the place. So he made the announcement in Parliament of the existence of this place. And after that, uh, the press were interested and were coming through in dribs and drabs. And, uh, and as I said, one of my first responsibilities was come out here and give a briefing to a whole bunch of folks from the press, which I did, uh, using some slides I called together and seemed to be successful. And I found, myself, I found myself doing that every couple of months with either one or two members of the press or a bunch of them. Even had Mike Duffy through here one time. Uh, interesting questions. He, he was... Uh, he gave us pretty fair treatment uh, in the, uh, the press. Uh, many of the others were, other members of the press were keen on um, downplaying this place sort of in a derogatory sense. You recall that was the time when there was a movie called The Day After come out and Carl Sagan, who is a pretty well-known science uh, popularizer, uh, was making comments about nuclear war and the possibility of you know, runaway um, nuclear winter, which, and so most of the press were sort of trying to interview things on that basis. Uh, and of course, I was not in much of a position to comment on that. That requires scientific and, and other knowledge that I didn't have, but of course, they'd always try and make you comment on it anyway. So I did. Uh, but I, I usually gave the comments because I'm a civil engineer by background and have studied this kind of stuff ever since I wrote my thesis on it at university on radioactive fallout and decontamination in, from water. Anyway, so I've been sort of interested. Anyway, and and I, 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 I sort of enjoy tweaking the press occasionally. But uh, we got mm, sort of either neutral, sometimes, sometimes sardonic coverage. Mike Duffy was one of the ones who 
I recall watching him present the information on, I think it was a Canada AM program, and the anchor in Toronto, and you know that most of his time was spent here in Ottawa, the anchor in Toronto was disparaging this whole thing, and he, he interrupted, which is rare for a journalist, and said, no, that's wrong. These people are serious, and this is a serious situation. Uh, it, because it was. I mean, this was the one of the bulwarks against chaos developing in the aftermath of the nuclear war, whether you believe nuclear war was going to happen or not. In the 80s, early 80s in particular, it was getting pretty hairy. I mean, it got hairy two times in the life of this place. Uh, once around the Cuban Missile Crisis time, and uh, once in the early 80s, when, of course, the Soviets had invaded Afghanistan, and they had, uh, uh, and Reagan's response to that was to uh, increase the armament of the United States, to which the Soviets replied by doing something likewise. And... Uh, so it was um, uh, interesting times, and we were probably not quite as close to war then as we were in the Cuban Missile Crisis, but there was times when things got uh, iffy here. And did you feel that the press wasn't taking that as seriously as the military was? Oh yes, oh definitely. The press definitely had not, and, and hardly ever did take the whole civil defense thing very seriously. This is, this place really is, in a way, part of the whole civil defense program uh, because you couldn't have the other government departments doing their civil defense functions without having this place to coordinate those functions. And to, uh, you also try to realize this, but this place is not the place that you would have run the entire government from. It couldn't be. Um, you would have to depend on surviving pockets um, now, we'll get into more detail on that, but basically it, it all depended on the size of the nuclear war. If, in fact, all weapons had been used all at once, then Carl Sagan was probably right. That would have been the end of things, either through nuclear winter, probably not through fallout poisoning, because there are many, many places in the world which, even if there was an all exchange of of nuclear weapons in the Northern Hemisphere, there would have been many places in the world that would have been relatively untouched. But the nuclear winter thing was a distinct possibility as far as I understand. Some scientists that would tell her, uh, I believe, uh, spoke against it. Other scientists, Carl Sagan, uh, spoke uh, as though it was a, a very distinct probability. Anyway, um, if there was just a a minor exchange, and how can you say that, but you can, relatively speaking, of nuclear weapons, then this place would have been a very, would have, would have worked. If there was something in the middle, I don't know, nobody knows. <coughs> As I t often say when I'm taking people on tours, people ask me, well, would this have worked? I said, I don't know, but we had to try. And this was basically an attempt at staving off chaos in the advent of a nuclear war and having some form of government, well, I used to call a thin thread of government from before to after. Would it have worked? We don't know. Uh, but uh, it was a better chance than doing nothing. And it really didn't, it sounds like $20 million is a lot, and it was a lot when this was built, because that's roughly what this cost to build. And then there was another, I don't know, 10 to 20 million dollars spent on fitting it and to do it and doing the other uh, uh, things but uh, we uh, uh, you know we that was the try uh, and you you said that you realized that the threat was a little more serious well, i think most of us in civil defense at the time because that's what emergency preparedness was Civil defense had evolved over the years, and there's a book in the library called, um, um, uh, let's see, um, Be Prepared Today for Tomorrow, and it's about the history of Emergency Preparedness Canada from 1948 to 1998, but deals with some of the time before and some of the time after. But the whole history of that was one of, um, uh, I would say benign neglect, except for a couple of times benign neglect. To give you an example, when other nations in the world were spending uh, $20 per person, $10 per person 
$5 per person on civil defense. Canada was spending 25 cents annually on civil defense. So it didn't get a lot of attention. Government departments were charged with doing various aspects of civil defense. Uh, there is a, in, a in, one, in the library, there's a copy of the 1981 planning order, which very succinctly and concisely lays out the responsibilities of, I don't know, 11 or 12 different government departments, including Emergency Preparedness Canada, for what they would, what their planning and their response responsibilities are during the nuclear war. And of course, I say that because those departments would have had a place here. And, and I go back to my original comment, but you would not have run the government from here. You would have had to have surviving areas. So around um, the country, there were other plans and arrangements, some in good shape, some not. But the people here in this bunker, their responsibility was to advise the war cabinet, the cabinet on what was happening. So you would find in, for example, the public works side here, you would find people and there would only be maybe 10 or 12 or 13 or 14 of them on shift. That means seven or so around at any one time, maybe 10, who knows. Um, in the public works departmental office on the 300 level, and they would be advising their minister, because the public works minister and the deputy minister and a few staff would have also been here. Uh, they would be advising that deputy minister on what was happening outside. And then that minister would have come to cabinet and explained it in the war cabinet room, or he would have brought uh, people from uh, the uh, departments in to talk about it. So that's just one of, of a bunch of others. Uh, uh, energy, mines and resources, as it was called then, uh, uh, agriculture, uh, central mortgage and housing. Uh, why central mortgage and housing? Because we're not really concerned with the mortgages at this time of the of uh, that kind of crisis, but we are concerned with where the housing is, <coughs> and they know it where the housing is. So all these government departments have a role, and they would have performed that role here, but it's mainly to advise the War Cabinet as to what's happening and, when, and what their, their projections are of what or would be as to what would be happening. To coordinate them, we had the Composite Secretariat, which is located just outside the War Cabinet room. We had the, the Federal Warning Center and the Military Information Center. There's a, more, there's a complicated relationship, which I can talk about there. And we had the Emergency Government Situation Center, the MGov Sitsen. That had been called something else prior to my coming on board in the, in the early 80s. Um, it was basically a civil defense status center uh, where they would plot fallout and uh, things like that. When I came in in the early 80s, we modernized it. My staff and, uh, uh, and some uh, contractors modernized that facility and the communications within the bunker. We did this on a shoestring because we had no real money for it. We'd squeezed a little bit of money out of DND, used most of that to put together the closed circuit television system that's in here now. And that was a means by which we could brief uh, selectively brief either ministers or ministers and departments or and it could select various um, um, aspects of the operation of the facility and we could selectively do that including just briefing cabinet if the if the news was really bad we could keep it to just cabinet so we we rebuilt the emergency government situation center modernized it and then proceeded over the next few years to have exercises, mostly in December in here, because we used the staff of the Emergency Preparedness College in Armprior to be part of the exercise. And we used a staff from the various government departments who had responsibilities in here to um, be participate in the exercise. I think the biggest one we ever had was maybe 60 or 70 people in this and you know that you know what it holds. So we never did get the entire attention of all government departments, but we got a few, uh, many of the critical ones. And instead of having six or seven people here, they'd have one or two. But we managed to have um, a few uh, exercises, mostly lasting, I think it was thirty-six to forty-eight hours, in which we would practice what would happen in the event of a nuclear war 
in Canada, what would happen to this place? We even closed it down once so we could practice what it was like that, doing that. Anyway, uh, that was uh, important because it revealed a number of shortfalls. Remember that we're not practicing and trying to determine what would happen in the event of nuclear war to the country. We're simply trying to practice the flow of information because our job is basically flowing information from outside sources and from sources we had here, analyzing it, collating it, and presenting it to cabinet so cabinet can make whatever decisions it uh, had to make at the time. Many of those decisions would not have affected the, the immediate situation, but would have been involved in long-term plan, long response planning. Um, okay, go ahead, sorry. sorry. I, I do tend to digress and, and wander, but it's as it comes to my mind, so you can one way or the other sort it out later. Um, so knowing what you did about um, the reality of the situation and going through these uh, um, drills and, and things in the bunker, um, did that make the Cold War more of a reality to you in your day-to-day -day life, did you find, or was this just... Um, well, that's a very good question, actually. The Cold War was always a reality to me because I had been in the Army, in the, in the Air Force initially, and then in the Army for 24 years before I left emergency, before I left to join Emergency Preparedness Canada. And part of that time was spent uh, over in Europe in the in Four Field Squadron as part of the Canadian Brigade Group over there. So we were practicing the dealing with nuclear war, even at the tactical level, on a practically a daily basis. The enemy then, uh, the frontier with East Germany was uh, not too many kilometers away. Uh, when I initially, when I was in the forces, I was when I was a combat engineer, a field engineer with the uh, then called Royal Canadian Engineers and now called Military Engineers. Um, and I had taken my training in Shilawak, BC, and taken further training and been a, 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 a troop commander in Gagetown. And then I was posted over to Germany in the late 60s. Uh, that really bought, brought the reality of war and the possibility of war home because we were planning to defend uh, Germany and we were uh, designing minefields, designing demolitions for bridges. We were going forward and doing reconnaissance of the, of the enemy positions or the potential enemy positions. Um, and we were participating in preparations for the defense of, of Europe if Europe had been invaded by the Warsaw Pact. So it was always a reality to, to me, especially when uh, part of that time I had been stationed with the uh, British Armored Engineers, 32nd Armored Engineer Re Regiment up in Hona. And uh, uh, Hona is a mere kilometers away from the border and some of the things we had to do involved going up to the border and even patrolling. So um, it was very real to me uh, and uh, you could see the border and you could see the mine strips and the guard towers and the barbed wire and the spotlights and whatnot. So while you folks in Canada, um, I don't think it really sunk into Canadians very much what the reality was, I mean, I got a, a small anecdote on that. I had been working here and obviously dealing with the potential for war from 80 to 89, uh, 83 to 89. And uh, I, uh, uh, I always thought to myself, this is not gonna end well. Uh, this, the whole buildup of defenses in, in Europe uh, and the buildup of nuclear strike and uh, capability and the building of these facilities, this is not going to end well. And so to me, the greatest miracle, and I was practically in tears when it was happening, and yet it sort of went over the heads of most Canadians, the greatest miracle of our time is the fact that the Cold War ended not with a bang, but with a whimper. And I, I still think that's amazing. I, I don't, and if there's ever any reason to believe in God, uh, then that's got to be because it, it gave us another opportunity. What we're going to do with it, I don't know. Anyway, uh, so it, to me, that was a miracle. Now, unfortunately, it ruined all my plans because we had this place getting more and more prepped and we were doing uh, more and more exercises and people were coming on board. There'd been a big hiatus from the time this had been constructed in the er and, and prepped in the early 60s. 
to uh, the late 70s, where nothing very much had happened here. And the military basically used this as their communications, uh, one of their main communication centers. And uh, interestingly enough, all the rooms here that are departmental and ministerial offices, or many of them, had been um, taken over for offices for every Tom, Dick, and Harry and private in the military had his own bloody office. And one of my jobs when I came in here in the early 80s was to kick them all out and reestablish the offices for what they were supposed to be for. One of the things I did very early on is to put a sign outside the front, right at the uh, airlock door, saying Central Emergency Government Headquarters. And there's a picture of that sign around, and I hope someday we'll be able to restore it because there was a constant reminder to the military what their position was here. While this was a military base, part of CS CFS CARP, and a main communication for them, uh, for the military, this was really built as a central emergency government headquarters, an emergency government facility for civilian government. And uh, uh, they, it took a while to, to get this going again. And we did a number of projects to I will, I will say, pee in the corners. One of the things we did is we instituted a complete uh, refurnishing of the place. Unfortunately for the museum, it meant we got rid of a lot of the furniture and equipment of the time because it was this gray, this, this stuff here. Uh, but, uh, and we put in modern office uh, furniture. Uh, so there are two looks to this place, to sort of the, the pre-mid 80s and the post-mid 80s. Um, one of the advantages of this, of course, is where an office before might have held uh, six or seven people with new furniture, we could have held seven or eight people, um, which was interesting because I'm going to digress here again. Um, it, came, when it, it came down to what is the purpose of these places in a, in the, toward the end of the Cold War, and what were we going to do with this in the future? And um, uh, in fact, in the late 80s, a new Emergencies Act had been, two acts had been passed. One is the Emergencies Act, and one is the Emergency Preparedness Act. And the Emergencies Act basically dealt with um, um, the, what, how we were going to treat emergencies less going to the War Measures Act, because in the, in the time of the FLQ crisis, uh, Trudeau had no tools to deal with this other than nothing or the War Measures Act. And over a period of time, uh, this, it had been decided to change this to give him more intermediate, or to give a prime minister more intermediate steps to go to. Um, the, the minister at the time, I remember meeting him, and he was a really good one, a minister, was Yvon Pinard. Uh, I think I heard him on the radio uh, a few days ago, in fact, dealing with something else. But anyway, uh, he's long since retired. But the Emergency Preparedness Act had a new statement in it, and it said it, it, we were dealing with emergencies, not just um, uh, emergencies that would involve the uh, a small group of war cabinet, interwar cabinet people. But we had to deal with emergencies and we had to re not just have emergency government, but we had to have a constant, an emergency government that was constitutional. So a constitutional emergency government. Well, that little addition of that word in that document had great implications for this place. Because as I say, normally this place would have been government by decree government by governor in council. Governor in council is the governor general plus four ministers. But now we had to have, we had to do with constitutional government. So it meant that there was a significant change in the way this place would have gone. So in other words, we couldn't just have the war cabinet and the governor general and the prime minister. We had to have a small representative number of parliamentarians here. And we had to have a small representation of the Supreme Court. And we had to have the same thing for the federal court. And all aspects of our government had to be represented here. Well, we did that. We had a lawyer look at this. And we 
analyzed it and we discovered that we'd probably have to have 60 more people in here. So we were in the process in the late 80s of abiding by this new change <laughs> by uh, probably changing our two bedroom civilian bedrooms, two, two, uh, our bedroom, civilian bedrooms from having six bed spaces in them to uh, putting uh, uh, nine bed spaces in them. Like the military bedrooms are downstairs with the nine spaces, we would have done that to the civilian spaces. And we've had to, had to rearrange things in here to some degree. You can't push out any walls or whatnot in here, so you would have had to crowd people up or maybe reassign rooms and things like that. Now, uh, because of the end of the Cold War, that didn't happen, and so my plans went to hell. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and I'm not sad to say, I'm not sad to sacrifice them, but it did change a lot of things. And we ceased having exercises in here too. Um, so that's, let's see, uh, go back to the question you just asked to make sure I answered, or I didn't. Um, I'm just gonna go back to something you said earlier. Sure. Um, you said that you visited the bunker during the 70s before you started. Yes. And when you found out that was before the bunker was made known public? Yes, was. it was very secret at the time. Um, so what were some of your first impressions of the tour itself? Was there anywhere that they didn't take you or that you weren't allowed? Oh yes, that's a very good question. Uh, my first impressions. I remember feeling really strange walking down that tunnel for the first time because this was the last ditch stand if something went wrong. And you're gonna now, I mean, I'd, I've always been a sort of a science fiction fan and, and some of these Tom Clancy type things. And walking down that tunnel was the eeriest experience I had had in a long time. And yet I had dealt uh, in Europe with all kinds of explosives and, and demolitions and I'd been doing that for years and it just became a matter of course. Um, We'd seen uh, Honest John uh, tactical missiles launched in, in operation, in, in non-operational sense, practice sense and things. It never gave me the feeling seeing all that. Even dealing with what we used to call atomic demolitions, which would be small nuclear bombs that we would have placed in cities to demolish them on our retreat back from the border. We, I didn't feel the, and we used to put these in practice, putting these in cities and putting barbed wire around them, etc. That never gave me the weird feeling that walking down this that tunnel did the first time. Anyway, we uh, did the, the tour, and yes, there were places we were not allowed to see. In fact, there were places I was not allowed to see even after I came back here as a civilian, and that's the Osax room. The Osax room was not called that then. It was basically a different kind of room then, and it was uh, off bound, out, out of bounds. And in fact, even when I came back here as head of the civil aspects, <laughs> I used to uh, take people on tours and look around and whatnot. But we were never allowed in the OSAX room and I used to nag the station officers about it one time, uh, uh, quite a lot at lunchtime and yeah, 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 I know. In the military, it's need to know and I had no need to know. But I used to nag them anyway. Did you uh, know what was in there? Did you have any idea? Roughly, but never having seen it. So anyway, um, actually my, my wife's niece used to work in there and uh, her name is Heather, um, Heather York with an E. Anyway, she uh, uh, worked and then one time when I was giving a tour, some folks, uh, she was sort of, she was down in the cafeteria, she was the corporal at the time and she's, hi Dave, how are you? So we had a little chat, everybody was sort of standing around, astounded, but I knew she worked there and I would never ask her any questions. However, some one day, toward the, the end of things, in the early, or late 80s, um, I was an egg in the station officers about this and uh, what they did is they said, okay, you've been asking about this for years, so come down and take a look. So went down to the, um, the, uh, the ramp area there and they opened the doors. Everything was covered in blankets. Couldn't see it wouldn't make any difference at all. So it was basically uh, uh, out of bounds. There was, uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, uh, one, I, and I don't know the details of this, and you'll have to ask them, but I don't think you'll find out for a long time. CSIS was involved in that room, in messages going in and out of that room. There had been a long time relationship between this place and CSIS. In fact, there's a plaque which Doug Beaton has that lists all the 
the serial, you won't even look at that plaque. I asked Doug Beaton to look at that plaque because on that plaque are the names of all the CEOs of this place and all of the chief warrant officers of this place. And in fact, one of the CEOs, I forget his name, one of the first guys, he, um, he's, he lives in Ottawa and he's, in, he's not in great health. Uh, so if you, if you did him, you'd, you'd have to uh, go into town, but I don't even know if he's with us right now. Anyway, uh, but uh, that's an interesting plaque because uh, a lot of people, unfortunately, a lot of people on there are dying. Like Doug, Doug Hildebrand, who was the uh, chief warrant officer here, and when he retired, became the curator for the uh, Signals Museum in Kingston. He's just passed away. Um, like my uh, uh, Bill Loban, who was my continuity of government officer, uh, he just passed away um, six months ago. So... Um, uh, the, the guy who was the um, coordinator, he was like Bill Loban was the ongoing on the site. Like he would go out here, come out here a lot, check things and troubleshoot things dealing with the military, etc. And uh, um, in fact, there's some of his. He had been in the military. There's some of his peacekeeping artifacts in here someplace. But anyway, uh, the other guy is Andy Renault. And Andy Renault was in charge of the whole thing. He was my operations officer. Andy Renault is still around. He's living in Ottawa. And uh, he probably could help you too. You might have to actually go to visit him as opposed to bring him out here. I don't know. Um, uh, who else is there? Don Smith has passed away. He used to be the operations officer in the MGOF Sitson. Um, um, let's see who else is there is. Uh, well, there's um, uh, Don Campbell is a young man. He's still around. I'm not sure exactly where he is, but I did see him some months ago. Um, he was the guy who actually physically put together the M our MGov sits in. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the contractor who did the, uh, the closed circuit television system was the guy who owned United Video in town. He unfortunately passed away last December, um, so you you gotta be getting us fast. <laughs> you won't have anybody. Uh, okay, so I, more questions. If I and if I didn't fully answer those questions because I digress, ask the question again. Okay. So you're talking about all these different people that you met while well, through your work with the. They worked for me, most of them. What did you feel was the sort of the atmosphere socially at the bunker between staff? And yeah, you see, there wasn't much of a social aspect at the bunker with my folks because we were never here full time, okay? The, 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 uh, not at all. We, we had some social aspects, social aspects to our, uh, our job in town. Remember, basically what we did is we ran the operations center and ran a number of programs in town uh, in the Jackson building on Spark Street or just off Spark Street. Um, then this was a secondary duty, some people it's tertiary duty, and we come out here and make sure things happen. So very rarely did we socialize, at least as a group with the military. Some people like um, Bill Renault, who was my communications officer, retired from here and came to work for me in town as my communications officer, but he was also responsible for the MGov communications out here and for other projects such as the uh, refurnishing. Uh, stuff. Now he's still around, and he's a good guy. Now his uh, his sister Linda Renault is uh, was uh, a high level secretary in the EPC. She never got out here actually, um, and I'll tell you. Ask me about that later because I'm trying to arrange an event in September where I get all these people together. Okay, we don't know where this is going to go, but I'm trying to arrange the event, um, and she's going to help me. I hope. Uh, who else is out here? Bernie Eldershaw. She was my secretary, and she would have had held down a desk in the MGov Sitsen, and she's still around, but she's not well. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Joe Prince. Joe Prince was before my EPC time. Joe Prince was the uh, draftsman technician on site here for a long time after the place was built. He came to work for us. Uh, basically, was transferred to the Uplands office for some years, left that, went to work for the Science and Technology Museum, and is now out doing 
private renovation contract type things. Anyway, he's, uh, he's around. I had him out here a couple of years ago. You might even be able to talk to him about what things were like here. But uh, if he's willing, I don't know. So uh, maybe we can find his address together somehow. You, by the way, you asked about what the mood was. Well, the mood was interesting. Uh, not so much the first time I came here, which I've given you an idea of what that was about. Actually, I guess part of that experience was seeing the nuclear roof fil film and realizing just how much knowledge and technical background had gone into building this place. It gave me quite a lot of respect for the builders, uh, project manager, um, uh, Ed Churchill, and whatnot. Uh, but also uh, the, uh, the company that, that, that built it. Uh, and anyway, they... Uh, be nice to try and follow up on them, see who they've evolved into. Um, but that's another story. Anyway, when I came back the second time, when I came back as a civilian, uh, it was uh, it wasn't quite the I'll call it the tunnel shock that I had had the first time. Uh, but uh, it was still a weird experience coming back here. The project that I had initiated in CE in construction engineering in the Mid late seventies had just been completed, <laughs> and uh, the, the new filters, the stainless steel filter pans you see down there now, are were that project. Um, the other thing was, I saw, I realized that I would have to come out here in the event of a nuclear war. So, what was going to happen to my family? I had a young daughter and, and a wife at the time. I still have them, but the daughter's not so young. <laughs> Neither is a wife, nor am I. So uh, uh, what was I going to do? In fact, uh, when I was building an extension on my house, uh, at that time I built a follow shelter, which is our wine cellar right now, into the basement of the house. Um, uh, it's currently lined with bottles of wine, which I guess give you a some nuclear protection factor. But uh, we're uh, in Manatic, which would be far enough away so that a nuclear bomb of five megaton nuclear bomb going off in downtown Ottawa would have created an overpressure of one pound per square inch, which would have probably broken a lot of glass, but otherwise we would have been all right if the bomb had hit where I expected it might hit. Um, anyway, so I, I still have the fallout shelter and it's got more wine in it. <laughs> um, but that, that meant I had to think about what would happen to my family because you can't bring families here. And in fact, one of my employees at the time was doing, had, was basically dealing with disaster financial assistance, but I had such excellent employees that because we were short staffed to do some other tasks, I could also give them tasks dealing with this place. And uh, Linda Brown, um, who I still know, uh, was um, uh, the person who I asked to and did put together a package of stuff that we would have handed out to people in the event of their having to come here. Well, hopefully beforehand, uh, and that was a problem. We, we never really did get it sorted out because we had all kinds of information ready, but the government wasn't willing for us to do anything that was overt. In fact, that would have, you know, handing out information to potential occupants of this place, I guess, would have been considered overt uh, if you handed it well in advance. And the other problem with that, too, is that <coughs> we had uh, lists of people who would have come here, and the list would have included uh, the folks who were primarily to come here, and then alternates, and then back up for the alternates. So the list was over a thousand people long, and the list was never really complete or, and properly done. I mean, my view was put somebody on the list, brief them, or have them briefed. Well, nobody wanted to do that. So what I did is I asked Linda to put together this package, which we had the elements all put together, which we then could reproduce. And I had um, a film produced by a government agency, really badly produced by the customs and excise people in um, that small town on the way to Montreal. Anyway, that's where they do customs and excise or customs training. They put this together, but they didn't do it very well. But it's called Just In Case, and it's in our film, in our film uh, library here, if you want to look at it. Uh, and that was to be handed out to people at the time. I had no money to deal with this, so we had to use whatever resources we could cobble together. Uh, interestingly enough, 
I had one person at DND who was a, mil a military officer who was in charge of the MRR or MRR program. That's the Miscellaneous Recurring and Replacement Program. And uh, he was sympathetic to this. And he made sure that because we had moved into the military in the early, moved back under DND control in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, uh, I was able to tap this program. And he put aside $100,000 a year for me. And that was really helpful because we'd had hardly anything out of VPC. They didn't have a very big budget at the time. <laughs> so I was able to use that to do various things uh, here. Uh, sorry, what I said 90s, I meant 80s. Or the, it was into the 80s. Anyway, all that to say that we did do some things that was pretty um, mom and pop, but at least we had the elements here. And ever, after every exercise, we were upgrading equipment and we're getting more and more attention from the departments and, and our own government, our own uh, department. Because I think when Don Hall gave it to me, it was sort of, well, you know, this is a responsibility. We're legally empowered to do it. It says so right in the legal documents of the time that Emergency Preparedness Canada was responsible for maintaining this kind of facility, this kind of capability, but everybody was paying it lip service, especially at the 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 especially in the mid to late 80s when memories were short of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and events that had happened. The same thing happened after the Cuban Missile Crisis. The memory seems to be half life of the memory seems to be two or three years, and then while they throw money at, at it at the time, very shortly thereafter they don't. <laughs> And then they begin to, especially some of the, the younger bureaucrats begin to poo-poo the whole thing. And then you find you have no money to speak of. So it has a very variegated career, a very variegated history in terms of, of uh, this place being prepared. But we did, we, I believed in it, so, and I got my staff to believe in it. So we, we and we made, we, actually we enjoyed doing it. It was kind of fun. Um, now, just, that reminds me, kind of fun. We used to uh, have events out here, and, and we'd make sure that the end of our exercise was sort of a party or something interesting was happening. But we did, so members of my staff used to come out here and interact with the military, and especially the ones who had a military background were able, were invited to attend parties and whatnot out here, as was I. And I didn't get to them all, but I got to some of them. And one of the ones I remember going to, uh, was invited to, and it's an honor to be invited in these circumstances, was to the Christmas party for the other ranks. The Christmas party for the other ranks, the military officers serve the other ranks. That's a tradition going back to the First World War, I believe. And uh, that's and I was invited to be one of the servers here and the uh, in the cafeteria. Uh, you will... If you look at the cafeteria, you'll see what looked like curtain tracks. And those curtain tracks, there was curtains on them and they could be closed off. So the place looked quite nice without having to look into the kitchen all the time. And so we basically served, uh, well, I guess there would have been um, other ranks from here. And when that varied, 60, 70, 80 people running the communications to some of my guys. Uh, to some of the people from Perth, for the Perth facility. So probably the, the cafeteria seemed to be quite full, and I would guess that may have been 80 or 90 people, and then there was uh, 10 or 15 officer-level people that fed them, and then we ate later in the officer's mess, because you know there's a small officer's mess area behind it, beside it. So, I mean, that, was, that would have been one of the social events. I recall being invited to the... Um, a couple of changing command parades, I couldn't make them all. And I recall being invited to the close down, but I couldn't make it. Um, I should have, I, sh I was feeling kind of bitter about the whole thing and I didn't make much of an effort, not realizing what I'd be involved with later. Um, and in this place as a museum, if I'd known that, man, I would have done a whole bunch of things to make sure that they, because the military when they left stripped this place, basically stripped it of everything and they were gonna seal it. And uh, uh, they weren't supposed to. Um, if you've interviewed Bob Borden, have you talked to him yet? You may have to go to his house, but you better get him soon. Uh, he is. He was. Um, he would have had a job here in the solid fuels part of energy mines or industry trade and commerce or energy mines resources. I forget which one. And he was very active in this place from after 
it closed to uh, the uh, early 80s. His you know, health is big. I mean, he was a guy who almost personally put our septic field in. He was our manager of this place for a, a long time as, uh, as a museum. Um, so that's Bob Borden. You get to him sooner rather than later. Um, he lives nearby. Um, anyway, he, um, uh, he did a lot of things here. And I'm trying to think of what I was getting at when I brought his name up. Um, anyway, he uh, would have had a spot out here in the event. So, um, and I'll come, probably remember later what I was going to say about him. Do you think you could remind me on that? Uh, but uh, there, were, there were a number of folks who went to some of these events, but there wasn't a close social contact between ourselves and the, the station. The first uh, station commander, Eric, and I don't remember his last name, that we had a really good relationship, and that was in the early mid-early 80s, uh, was supportive of us, but some of the subsequent ones weren't. Because, of course, we were pushing people around a bit. We were saying, you can't get in that office. That office is supposed to be for uh, this department, so please move. And uh, we were shooing them out of all these little areas. Um, and, uh, oh, yeah, when the bunker was to, uh, was to close, the Bob Borden was one of a number of the people in CARP who, I don't know if it's literally, but figuratively anyway, stood in front of the bulldozers saying, you shouldn't close this place. And they made arrangements to keep it open. But And the military were told, according to Bob Borden, the military were told by PCO, Privy Council Office, not to take anything out of here that was at all, that, that, other than the stuff that was classified. But they didn't, they stripped it. I think the reason they did that is that they either were they lost something got lost in the translation or, or the process, or they just wanted to get so much out of this that they'd never get back into it again because they considered it a costly waste of money. It really wasn't, but they did. Um, the military is, and I haven't been in the military for 24 years, I understand this, the military can make the case for whichever case they want to make. So let's, um, we had said, uh, as emergency preparedness, we had said, can't you just mothball this place? I mean, maybe we shouldn't have, shouldn't get rid of it. Maybe we'll need it sometime. Can't you just mothball it? And in fact, I had written a paper while in emergency preparedness giving five what I thought were good reasons, justified good reasons for keeping this place. Uh, everything from a small dirty bomb type threat to the all out nuclear war, which was becoming less and less obvious, you know, uh, uh, but there was other aspects. And uh, no, they wanted out of here and they wanted, once we had come under their control as a result of the Nielsen report and the reallocation of departments, they just jammed it down our throat. So in 92 or three, well, we got out of here in 92, they were pushing us to get out of here in 91. And that's when they closed down the siren systems, the nuclear attack warning system, the national survival attack warning system, they closed down of all of the other bunkers across the country, and they closed down everything. We have done this when no other nations have done this, um, which is interesting because after 9-11, I went back as a consultant now, remember I'd retired from EPC in 97, I went back as a consultant to advise them because they, uh, first of all, as a result of the big ice storm in, in 98 and then and then 2011 happened, and I came back advising in another capacity for a number of years. It became obvious that they needed a spot, but now they didn't have this spot. We put to them, maybe you could use part of this spot and pay us. That would have helped us keep going as a museum. But And some people were in favor of that, but the right people weren't, so it never happened. Don't ask me where the new location is. I have a pretty good idea, but I won't tell you. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so it's uh, the relationship between the military and ourselves has been sort of off and on over the years. But remember, they kept this place going when if the civilians had run it in the 60s, 30s, uh, 60s into the late 70s, it wouldn't have run. But the military had its own reasons for keeping it going. Now. Keeping this place open and then opening it as a museum. Yeah. As well. 
Why, why do you think it was important? Why is it important? Oh, oh I, I, I really think it's important as, first of all, our American friends are very good at this. They always keep one or another of the, I'll call them weapon systems, but more things. Uh, for example, just recently I was down visiting a Titan II missile base uh, in Tucson, Arizona, one of the only ones left, the, I think the only one left. Um, and it's been deactivated. Missile's still in it, but it's been all oh, cleared out, etc. It's been turned into a museum. They found a benefactor, which has enabled them to a lot of good things. But, but the person who is the curator of that museum, and we had her up here a couple of years ago, she uh, was the former uh, miss, the commander of that missile base. It makes it rather interesting. But uh, they do that. We should be doing that too, but we don't. So I think this is important to keep it open until such time. And it's happened to some degree as governments realize its importance to Canadian history and therefore help us with funding. Well, I tell you, in the 90, from 97 to early 2000s, we were getting very little help from government, very little help from government. Parks Canada was giving us advice and, and, and they gave us a couple of money for a couple of projects, but very frankly, uh, we got nothing. We still probably would not have gotten the money for the big uh, uh, fire safety project if it wasn't for the recession. But, uh, and it's really weird because this, is a, this was a federal institution. You think the federal government would be interested, but frankly, they haven't been to much extent, uh, but they are, they seem to be getting a little bit more helpful. Um, provincially, we've there, there was no real direct connection provincially, yet we've had some money from the province. The people who've given us the most money to keep us going have been the city. And theoretically, it's in the city limits, but it wasn't a city facility. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm delighted and amazed, and, and we need the continuing support, and they've been doing very really good. And I think it's beginning to pay off now in terms of visitors. As I've often said, people don't come to Ottawa to see the Diefenbunker, but they may stay an extra day, and often do stay an extra day to see the Diefenbunker. And so there's food and accommodation and other costs uh, which they incur, which go into the city uh, businesses and, and through taxes the coffers. Why do I think it's important? I am really convinced that the, and this has become evident since the end of the Cold War, uh, that we need to make sure that a facility like the facilities like this are are kept available for the public to see, and that uh, because uh, I'm convinced that those who uh, uh, forget their past are doomed to relive it. I forget the name of the guy Santana, whatever it was, who said that, something like that. But I I do think the youth has the youth of today have to understand what the Cold War was all about how dangerous it was. I'm not saying that they should be against the war or for the war. They should just understand what it was all about um, because if they forget, it'll happen again and we won't have the people to be able to deal with it who will, will understand what it was all about. So I'm absolutely convinced that this is a, uh, a time capsule for the future. Now, our mandate is not just to maintain the bunker, but to maintain a Cold War museum as part of the bunker. Uh, and uh, I'm convinced that we need to do a lot more in terms of displays, interesting displays and, and artifacts for visitors. Um, but we definitely have to make uh, this continue for the future so that uh, the youth of tomorrow will understand what it was all about. Um, and I think that's true of any museum. Uh, people have to understand what it was all about. The Cold War is a particularly interesting um, thing in relation to hot wars. If you look at the War Museum, which I have greatest respect for, they don't have much on the Cold War. Well, a lot of people didn't, well, not overtly die because of the, of the Cold War, but uh, a lot of people were threatened by the Cold War. In fact, the world was threatened by the Cold War. So they don't have much on it, and nothing very much seems to have happened. Now, you've been to the War Museum, I'm sure, and you've seen what they have. In fact, they have some stuff there that was in here. In fact, it used to be in the Old War Museum, they had the nuclear attack status board in their display, and they had my writing on it, <laughs> because I was the last person who filled it in in the exercise. But uh, and they still have that in the back rooms of their storage area, 
we were trying to get our hands on some of the things like that from them. In any case, uh, they don't have much on the Cold War. So this is our opportunity to do something on the Cold War. We have the space. It's costly to maintain the four or $5,000 a month just for the electrical bill and whatnot. Uh, but it's worth it. And the interest of the public has gone from six or 7,000 visitors in our first few years to uh, I think we're 45 and climbing in the last while. So uh, that shows there's an interest. I have a little anecdote on that too. You're gonna be, have lots of them. When this place was due to be closed down, I was invited out here, I think it was in 91 or 92, to preside over or be part of and partially preside over a group of uh, departmental officials from other government departments to see what could be done with this facility. And um, remembering that, oddly enough, that building you see outside, which is the library, had been built in the 15 months prior to this being closed down, so we, <laughs> which is kind of weird. Uh, and so we had that space and this space, etc. Nobody could see any interest in this place whatsoever for their particular storage or operational needs. So that went by the by. Um, I, we even approached the museum people, the parks, the heritage people, and uh, nobody could see that anybody would be interested in this place at all. In fact, who would come all the way out here to go and come and visit this place? Which uh, says something about some of the higher level bureaucrats in some of these organizations. The lower level bureaucrats, medium, medium level bureaucrats, were quite supportive of the idea. I, um, and, uh, and Doug will give you names and whatnot. Uh, but uh, most of them, no, there's no reason. Why would, why would we want this? And so I was still working for EPC at the time. So I said, oh, I guess that's it. Then it's going to be sealed. And then I heard some years later, it was 96, that CBC was doing one of its last broadcast, or a broadcast from here, celebrating the fact there had been a CBC studio in here. And uh, one of the current uh, CBO broadcasters, I forget his name, was doing a broadcast from here. And that was kind of interesting. And I was listening to this. I'm a CBO fan. I listen in the morning. So I was listening to this. And, oh, oh, they're going to close the bunker up finally. Well, that's, that's too bad. I, uh, and then Connie Murray called me and said, you know, we're going to try and keep it open. Now, my date's maybe not quite correct, but anyway, we're going to try and keep it open. Oh, and she was writing a book on this place. So I said, well, I'm not retired yet, but as soon as I retire, I'll come out and, and give you all the information I can uh, about the place and uh, walk you through it and everything. Um, it's been totally stripped at this time. There was all this furniture wasn't here. We acquired other places. And uh, so, in fact, I went to a Diefenbunker Development Group meeting, which was held at the Anglican Church, and was listening to people talk. And I suddenly realized, I don't think people really understood the government role in here. They understand the communications role in here. But I don't think they understood, at least it was my impression, that they didn't understand the government role in here fully anyway. So I had a whole bunch of slides I used to give briefings to reporters on this. In a, so I pulled them out and gave them a briefing. And I think that was a, a bit of a revelation to them the, that this place probably was more important than they thought. I still have that briefing and I still... Um, um, it's in my office just over the office just over here. But um, it was interesting to see the reaction because and, and then we start and then we just began to get moving more and more. And I'm not saying I initiated because the guy who initiated was Dr. Barry Bruce. He was the man who made this work. I was just along for the ride and to provide information I could. And uh, it just began to take off. A lot of volunteers. Uh, it's too bad we've lost a lot of their names. But I think somehow we should put together a list of the volunteers' names before the people that might remember them or better memories than I forget them. Because some of them were only here for two or three years. Uh, a young lady by the name of Kathy lives, used to live nearby. She was the PR person, was really energetic in getting PR for this place. Um, we had, uh, and under when she was here, and that was in the late 90s, we had, um, uh, we had Pravda. 
come and visit us. Now, I must tell you another anecdote. In the early 2000s, we had a visit from the Russians. Okay. Um, Sergei Ivanov, who is currently the deputy prime minister or premier of Russia, who in fact, whose name in fact appeared in the, in the newspaper story yesterday in conjunction with that aircraft crash in Russia. He's also the person in charge of air transportation in Russia. Well, he was at the time, he was defense minister for Russia. And again, this is after the Cold War. And he and five Russian generals and two Russian naval commanders and some RCMP came out for a tour of this place. And so Sean Moffat was the curator at the time, or the manager at the time. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll give the tour. And so they arrived in limousines and whatnot. And then we took them down the tunnel for what was to be about a half an hour tour. And they... I was walking backwards down the tunnel. Uh, Sergei, or it was Mr. Ivanov, was in a blue serge suit or something like that, and there were, everybody else was in uniform. Sorry, no, the RCMP guys weren't in uniform, but the generals and the naval commanders were in uniform. And the Russian generals looked every bit of what you caricature a Russian general to look like. Big, burly, short-cut hair, swept up hats, huge masses of medals. Anyway, they didn't speak much English. Uh, Sergei speaks or spoke good English. So what was to be a half an hour or so tour ended up being about two hours. <laughs> and we spent the last part of it in an exhibit on the 400 level there. Maybe we spent 20 minutes to a half an hour in an exhibit on Cold War toys. And uh, uh, we had, Doug can show you, we have uh, some Cold War toys here from both sides of the uh, Iron Curtain. Russian toy tanks, and here we have a KGB game and a bunch of stuff like that. And uh, they just were like kids in a candy shop looking at this stuff. Um, the only thing disappointing about that is I had asked uh, Sergei if we could somehow look at an exchange of artifacts or getting an exhibit on Soviet civil defense here, which would be a fascinating exhibit. And he had turned to one of the naval commanders and told him he was responsible. But when I followed up, nobody did anything. And this was, now this was a long time ago. It was, oh, let me think now. Um, Got to be eight or nine years ago. Eight years ago anyway. That was post-11, 9-11. And I was working here part time as a volunteer and on the board and stuff like that, but building little exhibits and stuff. We Some of them you see the fallout shelters and stuff like that. And I didn't feel in a position because I was working on classified material with the government that I could write the defense minister of, the, of Russia and put the arm on him to come through with what he had promised. I just, I was, my classification was top secret, so I didn't want to do anything to endanger that. So I didn't. Um, interesting talking to Iwana, our uh, executive director who's just coming in now. Uh, she's from Romania, and she will have no qualms at all about uh, contacting some of these people. She speaks the language, the language of communism, so it'll be interesting. Uh, so let me think, what else have I missed here? Um, I did uh, tours for a long time at the beginning and did special presentations. And when Alex was here, I did, and I still have with me, and I could do it again if the museum is interested, a presentation that I give uh, as though I am the Director of Emergency Operations Coordination and welcoming people here on the eve of a potential nuclear war to positions they will occupy in the bunker. Um, I lost the electronic version I, I have of that, but I, I have it in the, the printed versions uh, someplace in the office I use over here. But uh, I do that in such a way as to be unnerving uh, to them. I've done it on a couple of occasions for large uh, museum groups that have come through here. And uh, I, it's, it's, it's kind of fun to do it because they, they get a kick of it. And I, I, Usually I give them 
um, we give them special identification cards, which describes, describes what department position they're occupying. And so they can ask questions with respect to that. And that's kind of interesting because uh, I, I'm a bit of an actor, I guess, and whatnot, so I can act the part. Um, so it's kind of fun to do that. And um, it brings home the seriousness of this place. Uh, and uh, I think it's important to do that. I, I kind of wish we could have a couple of introductory films like many museums do, which set the scene that people, visitors, when they come in, could see this 10 minute film and and realize the seriousness of the situation and then do their tour, whether they're doing a guided tour or a self-guided tour. Um, anyway, that's my views on that. Um, so what else? Um, um, I just wanted to go back. You mentioned this a while ago now, but um, talking about your family and the fact that you couldn't bring them in here and the fact that you built a solid shelter at your at your home. But what? how did your family feel about the Cold War and you working here and did they take a nuclear attack seriously? Or well, my, my family is, at the time, was my very young daughter mm -hmm. and so it didn't click with her at all. She was, you know, in their early, late, early teens maybe. And my wife, who has been my wife for 37 years, followed me through to Europe, or been with me in Europe, and we've been all over Europe, and uh, we've even participated in a communist demonstration in Florence in the late 60s, that's another story, but anyway. Uh, we, uh, with a, uh, so she's been, she understands this whole business. Uh, like possibly most Canadians, she never thought it would really happen, and I guess I never thought it would, I never, it was a question of not thinking it would happen or not ho hoping it wouldn't happen, uh, but being prepared in case it did. And so, I mean, it wasn't a thing that I, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, worried about. You can't do that. I mean, in Europe, when we were in Europe in the, in the army, I mean, in the middle of the night, we'd get a tap on the window or knock on the door, and we'd have to bug out, literally, because we were practicing nuclear war. Then you'd hit three o'clock in the morning, you'd get an alert, and you'd have to go to your base, grab all your equipment, your trucks, which are all preloaded, and bug out into hides in the, in the area, uh, because that base was obviously a nuclear target for a tactical nuclear missile. So uh, uh, we practiced this time and time and time again. It's called quick train. And you, you know, hear it, we didn't, most of us didn't have phones in our houses there, they're very difficult to get, you'd hear a rock hit the window or someone tapping on the window and then you'd just open the window and the guy would say, quick train. Immediately you grab your gear, which you have all prepared, something like a fireman, get it on and get to the base, grab your stuff and with a half an hour, bug out into the boonies. So this would happen time and time again during our time over there. And so you were sort of used to that. Um, the, the, the instructions for the dependents were uh, for, uh, Basically, you were never allow your car to get less than half a gas tank full and uh, bug out east, oh, sorry, west, and just keep driving. <laughs> so she was sort of used to it. We travel all over Europe. Uh, we, we, uh, we would uh, see the preparations. If you went toward the, um, the East German border, all, every bridge, most every bridge in Europe has got a a uh, low classification sign on it for military vehicles, a big sort of yellow sign with a, a tank and a, and a, and a uh, you know, this could take a 60 ton tank or this could take a 16 ton tank or whatever. Uh, you would see what are called meso shafts uh, in the road in, in defiles where there's a, uh, the road narrows and or constricted because of terrain. And you see these what look like manholes in the ground about uh, 40 meters apart, and there were three of them always, and those were to be loaded with explosives and, and blown up in the event. All the bridges in Europe, in Germany anyway, were set up for demolitions. All you do is go down, open up a chamber, stuff in the demolitions, close the chamber, bring the uh, ignition system out, and blow it. You didn't have to think or do anything. It was just all set up for demolitions. So that mentality is always there. Um, and you sort of get used to that. I mean, I remember growing up in Montreal in the uh, 50s and basically doing uh, duck and cover grills in, in school. So, <clears throat> and hearing sirens. You sort of, 
accepted it, I guess. Um, but as you get more and more, I mean, most Canadians would just move on from that. I just happened to uh, stay involved. Um, when I went to university, um, I was in a parachute club. Uh, I ran the parachute club for three or four years there. And uh, we had a good relationship with the base. And um, at the same time, Diefen Baker was uh, pushing a program for people to join a sort of a special reserve and take training in civil defense and rescue operations and things like that. So as a lark, um, somewhat as a lark, and because we got paid, uh, and, and the money would help pay for our jobs, uh, much of the parachute club joined this and took training two days a week down at one of the armories. You know, these are students taking uh, engineering or science or, or various arts or business programs. And we're all members of the parachute club and just love all this stuff. So uh, we said, well, well let's, we'll all join. So we did. And we took all the training. We we're all buddies. Uh, we did exercises. We even did a, a, a quasi-rescue jump out in one of the camp gauge down, uh, base gauge down areas there. You know, you're young and this is kind of exciting stuff and it's interesting. And hey, they're going to pay me to learn how to rescue people in the event of, a, of, a, of an emergency. Uh, oh, okay, sure. And they paid well, actually, enough to pay for my parachute jumps for many years. But uh, that was a that lasted about a year. And uh, but that got me interested in civil defense. In fact, I still have at home my civil defense uh, um, certificates that you got at the time. And that sort of got me interested. And uh, and then when I got into the business as the director of emergency operations coordination. Oh, and, and having this as a responsibility, plus other emergency preparedness responsibilities, it, it became quite interesting. I really like, like emergency planning. In fact, I've done the pandemic plan for the bunker here. Um, everybody's got to have an emergency plan, I guess. So anyway, it's and my wife all along was very supportive and understood. And the fallout shelter wasn't a big issue because that's where we stored our wine and we love our wine. <laughs> <laughs> we make our own, uh, so we needed room. Uh, it's in, and, and it, uh, it, it, it's, it's not quite as strong as or as well done as these ones because I had to pay for it. But um, anyway, so um, okay, cause I just you probably are running out of time. It's an hour and a half. One, one Shoot. more question to finish up. Um, how for you? How, how has the Cold War sort of shaped your your life experience as a whole? Just sort of. You can probably say, from what I've just said, a lot, um, which is why I'm really interested in making sure the youth of today understand what it was all about. But it's a sh it's shaped, but it, it's never shaped it in the fear sense, really. Concern, a bit. Anxiety, not much. Um, it, it, what it did shape is my mental attitude to being prepared for whatever contingency, whether I'm preparing for an emergency or, you know, preparing, uh, I don't know, to fix my boat or, or you know, work in my cottage. I, and I'm an engineer, so I tend to think ahead analytically uh, in terms of how things should go and what they should look like. But it also made me really adamant about making sure that this place survives and, and looks good and, and, and does all the right things.